In this series of videos, we're going to talk more about compounds that atoms form. So we have a, a rudimentary idea of an atomic structure for an atom, and now we're gonna talk about how those atoms can form compounds. And we aren't going too deep on this material right now. We're just really setting our foundation, and we will spend a lot more time talking about atomic structure, both the electronics of the atom and also the nucleus of the atom. And we're gonna spend a ton of time talking about how things bond in this quarter. But we kinda need to know a little bit of everything before before we even really dive into those topics in more detail. So let's start with chemical formulas. So elements will combine in a number of ways to form different compounds. Um, compounds are thought of as uh, a combination of atoms coming together in different, like, different amounts to form something new. Um, and these are entirely new substances with completely different properties than the elements that made them up. So we can think about combining carbon, which is this solid, I've got a piece of it here, um, and we can combine hydrogen, which is a gas, and we can form something like octane, which is fuel, which you can burn and it'll run your car, um, or other things, <laughs> uh, which is three, or sorry, eight of those carbon atoms and 18 of those hydrogen atoms arranged and forming bonds together in a way that makes it a completely different substance that has entirely different properties. For one, it's a liquid. So within compounds too, things that have the same chemical formula might actually be totally different molecules. And these we call isomers. And these are the same number of atoms in the same proportions, but arranged differently relative to one another. And when they're arranged differently in space uh, relative, they're going to have different properties. And so here we're taking that octane example again. So we have eight carbons and 18 hydrogens. And here are just a few of the different isomers that we can form. Two methyl heptane, 2,5-dimethylhexane, 2,2-dimethylhexane as well. And, and they, they have completely different reactivity. I mean, they have some similarities because they, they all have the same elements. And so all of these would be insoluble in water, but uh, they'll have different melting points. They'll have different uh, reactivities with other um, chemicals like oxidants, things like that. And now when we talk about these arrangements relative to one another, we're really talking about how the atoms are bonded to one another. And that bonding is the joining of two atoms in a stable arrangement. Um, and typically elements are either going to gain, lose, or share electrons in order to have um, the same number of electrons that a noble gas would. Remember, our noble gases, when we talked about the periodic table, are inert. They're very stable. They don't actually do much reacting with anything. And that's because they have this filled shell of electrons. And so everything's trying to be like a noble gas. They're trying to reach that stability. Um, and so if they gain or lose electrons to form an arrangement with other ions, then we're, we're looking at an ionic bond. Um, so this is going to be an electrostatic attraction between a positively charged atom and a negatively charged atom or molecule. Um, and that static uh, or electrostatic attraction between the cation and anion um, forms a, a, a bond. Now, if electrons are shared between two elements, or two atoms, so they feel like they've got eight by sharing, then that's going to form a covalent bond. And in this case, the electrons are spending time, so, uh, so electrons on two atoms are actually spending time around both of the nuclei, and that's the sharing that we're talking about. So we don't have an electrostatic attraction anymore. Instead, we have the attraction of an electron or two electrons to two different nuclei that form that um, stable arrangement of two atoms joining together. So these are two really different types of bonding um, that we're talking about. And, and we'll probably spend more time in this quarter on covalent bonding, um, which really then opens up this entire world of organic chemistry to us. Um, but they're both extremely important. All right, now let's talk about chemical formulas so we can track these, these compounds. So a, a chemical formula is gonna indicate the ratio of elements present in a compound. Um, it gives us the relative number of atoms or ions that come together to form that stable arrangement. 
we're going to use the element symbols that we introduced with the periodic table and with our isotope symbols. Um, and then we're going to use subscripts to indicate that ratio. So before when we had, let's get a pen. Uh, before when we had our isotope symbols, we always had our atomic number in the lower left hand, our mass number up in the upper right hand corner of our element symbol, our charge up in our upper right hand corner. And now in the lower right hand corner, we're going to put our mole ratio. We haven't talked about the mole yet. So really this means the number of atoms relative to other atoms in the compound. So we'll write it down in that lower right hand corner. So let's interpret something. Let's look at this H2O. Uh, hopefully this one is familiar. Um, if you haven't seen, uh, there's, there's a video I'll link in the, the um, Canvas page about uh, a petition against the use of H2O. It's a, it's a chemical, it's a deadly, <laughs> it's water, right? Um, sorry, I gave away the joke. Oh, well. Um, so when I'm reading this, I'm seeing the H tells me that I have hydrogen atoms in the compound. And the O tells me I have oxygen atoms in the compound. The two tells me that I have two of my hydrogen atoms for every one oxygen atom. Because when I don't have a number following in that lower right-hand corner, we assume that number is one. Because if I'm writing the element symbol, there's at least one of them in this compound, right? Um, it's important to note that uh, capitalization is really important when we're talking about chemical symbols. Um, so iron, for example, or let's take a different one. Let's take uh, cobalt is a great example and carbon monoxide. If I write my uh, cobalt atom, its element symbol is CO. And if I want to write carbon monoxide, it's carbon's element symbol and oxygen's element symbol. And so these are the same letters. And the difference between these is one is a metal element and one is a compound between carbon and oxygen. And the difference is whether or not that oxygen is capitalized. So in our element symbols, if it's always the first letter that's capitalized and the second one is lowercase. So that way we can differentiate the element symbols and when a new one starts, when it's capitalized. Um, so let's take a look at empirical versus molecular versus structural formulas now. An empirical formula is going to be kind of our lowest common denominator. It's the relative numbers of atoms um, within the compound to one another. And that's it. It's our most reduced form of our chemical formula. And so I might have something that is iron and sulfur. And I have one iron for every one sulfur in this compound. Now a molecular formula is going to provide the actual number of atoms. If I'm talking about a large ionic, a compound like an ionic compound lattice, so like a large hunk of salt that has iron and sulfur atoms, and there's a lot of them, I would just use my empirical formula to be like, I got a bunch of these things, but they're in a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, a molecular formula is going to be used when I'm talking about something smaller. So I'm saying, actually, I have a compound that's pretty cool, and it's just two iron atoms and two sulfur atoms, and that is a self-contained unit on its own. And so then I would write out iron 2, sulfur 2. And I would use the two subscript to show that I have two atoms of iron and two atoms of sulfur. Now, the empirical formula for this molecular formula is FES. It's iron sulfur. Um, so I would just divide them all by two. Now, a structural formula gives even more information. That's going to show how they're connected. And we use structural formulas a lot in organic chemistry and also some in inorganic chemistry. And for our particular example, I would show that actually it's, it's each iron is connected to a sulfur. And we form this nice little square arrangement. And so this structural formula shows me the order that they're connected relative to one another. And we'll use all three versions of these. Um, Typically, we'll mostly use molecular formulas, and then when we spend a lot more time in covalent bonding, we'll, we might use some structural formulas. So within these chemical, chemical formulas, we can actually arrange these and um, or represent them in different ways. So I want you to be aware of what you're going to see. So the written out, I'm writing on paper and on the board. I'm going to use the chemical formula that's just written out linearly, like I could type in a word processing program. 
Now, here's my a structural formula in a sense, or it's actually really just writing out a Lewis dot structure. Um, and so I can represent each atom as its chemical symbol and show the order in which it's connected. And this shows that I have four hydrogen atoms connected to that carbon. Then we have the ball and stick form right here that shows each atom as a little ball and accentuates that bond by making it look like a stick. When we do molecular modeling with like kits, we usually make structures that look like this. But it's not a really accurate view of what this atom looks like. Now a better one is the space filling model right here. A space filling model really shows overlapping representations of atoms with one another. And so when electrons are shared between atoms, we really have those clouds of electron density overlapping with one another. And so we can think of that molecule as being these kind of overlapping spheres of electron density. And so they would look more like a cluster of bubbles um, to create its actual shape. And so that's our space filling model. And you'll see examples of all four of these throughout our class. So try this practice problem and I will have a separate video with the solution.